Part 4 of Time Crime by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Time Crime Part 4 Salgath Trod sat alone in his private office, his half finished lunch growing cold on the desk in front of him as he watched the teleview screen across the room, tuned to a pickup behind the speaker's chair in the executive council chamber ten stories below. The two thousand seats had been almost all empty at one thousand, when council had convened. Fifteen minutes later, the news had broken. Now, at fourteen thirty, a good three quarters of the seats were occupied. He could see in the aisles the gold plated robot pages gliding back and forth, receiving and delivering messages. One had just slid up to the seat of Councilman Hastor Flan, and Hastor was speaking urgently into the recorder mouthpiece. Another message for him, he supposed. He'd gotten at least a score such calls since the crisis had developed. People were going to start wondering, he thought. This situation should have been perfect for his purposes. As leader of the opposition, he could easily make himself the next general manager, if he exploited this scandal properly. He listened for a while to the centrist management member who was speaking. He could rip that fellow's arguments to shreds in a hundred words, but he didn't dare. The management was taking exactly the line Salgath Trod wanted the whole council to take. Treat this affair as an isolated and extraordinary occurrence. Find a couple of convenient scapegoats, cobble up some explanation acceptable to the public, and forget it. He wondered what had happened to the imbecile who had transposed those Kolgor sector slaves onto an exploited timeline ought to be Shanghai to the Kifton sector and sold to the priests of Fasif. A buzzer sounded, and for an instant he thought it would be the message he had seen Hastor Fan recording. Then he realized that it was the buzzer for the private door, which could only be operated by someone with a special identity sign. He pressed a button and unlocked the door. The young man in the loose wraparound tunic who entered was a stranger. At least his face and his voice were strange, but voices could be mechanically altered, and a skilled cosmetician could render any face unrecognizable. He looked like a student, or a minor commercial executive, or an engineer, or something like that. Of course, his tunic bulged slightly under the left armpit, but even the most respectable tunics showed occasional weapon bulges. "'Good afternoon, Councilman.' the newcomer said, sitting down across the desk from Salgoth Trod. I was just talking to... somebody we both know. Salgoth Trod offered cigarettes, lighted his visitors, and then his own. What does our mutual friend think about all this? he asked, gesturing toward the screen. Our mutual friend isn't at all happy about it. You think, perhaps, that I'm bursting into wild huzzas? Salgoth Trod asked. If I were to act as everybody expects me to, I'd be down there on the floor, now, clawing into the management tooth and nail. All my adherents are wondering why I'm not. So are all my opponents. And before long, one of them is going to guess the reason. Well, why not go down? The stranger asked. Our mutual friend thinks it would be an excellent idea. The leak couldn't be stopped, and it's gone so far already that the management will never be able to play it down. So the next best thing is to try to exploit it. Salgoth Trod smiled mirthlessly. So I am to get in front of it and lead it in the right direction? Fine, as long as I don't stumble over something— if I do, it'll go over me like a fifth-level bison herd. Don't worry about that, the stranger laughed reassuringly. There are others on the floor who are also friends of our mutual friend. Here, what you'd better do is attack the Paratime Police, especially Tortha Karf and Verkan Vall. Accuse them of negligence and incompetence, and by implication of collusion and demand a special committee to investigate. And try to get a motion for a confidence vote passed. A motion to censure the management. Say... Salgoth Trod nodded. It would delay things, at least. 
and if our mutual friend can keep properly covered, I might be able to overturn the management." He looked at the screen again. "'That old fool of a Nanthev is just getting started. It'll be an hour before I could get recognized. Plenty of time to get a speech together. Something short and vicious. You'll have to be careful. It won't do, with your political record, to try to play down these stories of a gigantic criminal conspiracy. That's too close to the management line. And at the same time, you want to avoid saying anything that would get Verkan Vall and Tortha Karf started off on any new lines of investigation. Salgoth Trod nodded. Just depend on me. I'll handle it. After the stranger had gone, he shut off the sound reception, relying on visual dumb show to keep him informed of what was going on on the council floor. He didn't like the situation. It was too easy to say the wrong thing. If only he knew more about the shadowy figures whose messengers used his private door. Koru in Hiragad held his aching head in both hands, as though he were afraid it would fall apart and blinked in the sunlight from the window. Lord Safar, how much of that sweet brandy had he drunk last night? He sat on the edge of the bed for a moment, trying to think. Then, suddenly apprehensive, he thrust his hand under his pillow. The heavy, four-barreled pistols were there, all right, but the money. He rummaged frantically among the bedding and among his clothes piled on the floor, but the leather bag was nowhere to be found. Two thousand gold obus, the price of a hundred slaves. He snatched up one of the pistols, his headache forgotten. Then he laughed and tossed the pistol down again. Of course. He'd given the bag to the plantation manager. What was his outlandish name? Dosu Golan. To key for him before the drinking bout had begun. It was safely waiting for him in the plantation strongbox. Well, nothing like a good scare to make a man forget a brandy head, anyhow. And there was something else, something very nice. Oh, yes, there it was beside the bed. He picked up the beautiful gleaming repeater, pulled down the lever far enough to draw the cartridge halfway out of the chamber and closed it again, lowering the hammer. Those two Jesru traders from the north, what were their names? Ganadara and Atarazola. That was a stroke of luck, meeting them here. They had given him this lovely rifle, and they were going to accompany him and his men back to Kariba. They had a hundred such rifles and two hundred six-shot revolvers, and they wanted to trade for slaves. The Lord Safar blessed them both. Wouldn't they be welcome at Kariba? He looked at the sunlight falling through the window on the still recumbent form of his companion, Faru Hin Oberon. Outside, he could hear the sounds of the plantation coming to life, an axe thudding on wood, the clatter of pans from the kitchens. Crossing to Faru Hin Oberon's bed, he grasped the sleeper by the ankle, tugging. Waken, Faru! he shouted. Get up and clear the fumes from your head. We start back to Kariba today. Faru swore groggily and pushed himself into a sitting position fumbling on the floor for his trousers. "'What day's this?' he asked. "'The day after we went to bed, Ninny.' Then Koru Hin Irigod wrinkled his brow. He could remember, clearly enough, the sale of the slaves, but after that... Oh, well, he'd been drinking. It would all come back to him after a while. Verkan Vall rubbed his hand over his face wearily started to light another cigarette, and threw it across the room in disgust. What he needed was a drink, a long drink of cool, tart white wine, laced with brandy, and then he needed to sleep. "'We're absolutely nowhere,' Ranthar Jard said. "'Of course, they're operating on timelines we've never penetrated. The fact that they're supplying the Krautha with guns proves that.' There isn't a firearm on any of the timelines our people are legitimately exploiting. And there are only about three billion timelines on this belt of the Krautha invasion. If we could think of a way to reduce it to some specific area of paratime, 
one of Ranthar Jard's deputies began. "'That's precisely what we've been trying to do, Clav. Val said. "'We haven't done it.' Dalla, who had been withdrawn from the discussion and was on a couch at the side of the room, surrounded by reports and abstracts and summaries, looked up. I took hours and hours of hypnomech on Kolgor sector religions before I went out on that wild goose chase for psychokinesis and precognition data, she said. About six or eight hundred years ago, there were religious wars and heresies and religious schisms all over the Karanda country. No matter how uniform the Kolgor sector may be otherwise, there are dozens and dozens of small belts and subsectors of different religions or sects or god cults. That's right, Ranthar Jard agreed, brightening. We have hagiologists who know all that stuff. We'll have a couple of them interrogate those slaves. I don't know how much they can get out of them. A lot of peasants won't be up on the theological niceties. But a synthesis of what we can get from the lot of them. That's an idea, Val agreed. About the first idea we've had here. Oh, how about politics, too? Check on who's the king what the stories about the royal family are, that sort of thing. Ranthar Jard looked at the map on the wall. The Krautha have only gotten halfway to Narkhan here. Say we transpose detectives in at night on some of these timelines we think are promising, and check up at the tax collection offices on a big landowner north of Jirda named Gromdor. That might get us something. Well... I don't want you to think we're trying to get out of work, Chief's assistant, one of the deputies said. But is there any real necessity for our trying to locate the wizard trader timelines? If you can get them from the Esron sector, it'll be the same, won't it? Marv, in this business, you never depend on just one lead, Ranthar Jard told him. And beside, when Squadron Curves Gang hits the base of operations in North America... There's no guarantee that they may not have time to send off a radio warning to the crowd at the base here in India. We have to hit both places at once. Well, that too, Val said. But the main thing is to get these wizard trader camps on the Kolgor sector cleaned out. How are you fixed for men and equipment for a big raid, Jard? Ranthar Jard shrugged. I can get about five hundred men with conveyors, including a couple of two-hundred-footers to carry airboats, he said. Not enough. Skordren Curve has one complete armored brigade, one airborne infantry brigade, and an air cavalry regiment, with Galdron Hestor equipment for a simultaneous transposition, Vol said. Where in blazes did he get them all? Ranthar Jard demanded. They're guard troops, from service sector and industrial sector. We'll get you the same sort of a force. I only hope we don't have another prole insurrection while they're away. Well, don't think I'm trying to argue policy with you, Ranthar Jard said. But that could raise a dreadful stink on home timeline, especially on top of this news break about the slave trade. We'll have to take a chance on that, Val said. If you're worried about what the book says, forget it. We're throwing the book away on this operation. Do you realize that this thing is a threat to the whole paratime civilization? Of course I do, Ranthar Jard said. I know the doctrine of paratime security as well as you or anybody else. The question is, does the public realize it? A buzzer sounded. Ranthar Jard pressed a switch on the intercom box in front of him and said, Ranthar here. Well? Visiphone call, top urgency, just came in for Chief's Assistant Verkan from Novaland Equivalent. Where can I put it through, sir? Here, booth seven. Ranthar Jard pointed across the room, nodding to Vol. In just a moment. End of Part Four